Thank you so much for stopping by. I'd like to apologize. We had some technical difficulties with the sound, so we did the best we could to take care of and edit out as much of the buzz as possible, but unfortunately there's some buzz that comes and goes throughout the recording this morning. Despite that, I hope that you are blessed, encouraged, and challenged by this message. Well, good morning, everyone. It is good to be back together with you all this morning. We're going to continue our series in the book of Revelation. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 12, in a message I've entitled, Time to Clean House. Uh, I, you guys can probably relate to the idea of a spring cleaning, maybe. You know, you, you just get, you had enough of the mess. Uh, you know, historically, one of the times that we, you know, so to speak, decided it was time to clean house was after December 7th of 1941. You, you see, Japan had invaded China in 1937, and we were not happy about that. In fact, we quit selling them uh, steel and petroleum products as a way of expressing our disdain. In fact, they used that as the excuse for bombing Pearl Harbor. The fact that we had said, no, we won't sell to you anymore because what you're doing in China is evil. But then it went from a passive, we won't aid you, we won't sell to you. After December 7th of 1941, it became a very active, we will put an end to your evil. And don't, don't doubt it, Japan and what the Empire of Japan did was evil. If you ever want to see just how wicked and evil they were, look into the events of what's known as the Rape of Nanking, China. Look into the death mark of March of Bhutan. There are so many things that were done by that empire that we decided it was time to clean house. All the way to the dropping of the two atomic bombs. We could not stop until their evil was brought to an end. Sadly, uh, I've heard that the nation of Japan has totally swept this under the rug. In fact, most of their students are completely ignorant of the history of the events surrounding World War II and the atrocities that the Empire of Japan committed around the world. Unfortunately, the only way to learn from your history as human beings is to be aware of it to continue to know about the Holocaust, to continue to know about the rape of Nanking, the death march of Bhutan, and all the other things that happened during that war, as well as the atrocities that American soldiers committed. But the overarching message to take from that is there is a time to put an end to evil. And today we're going to see God's predetermined time to put an end to the presence of evil in the heavens. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that in the end you do vanquish evil. That the death and destruction that we have lived through and we have been a part of as the human race will come to an end one day. Thank you for that. Father, I pray that you would help us now, help me to preach accurately, help us to hear with discernment and most importantly and most difficultly, Lord, help us to live differently. stood against me and delayed my journey for 21 days. That happens, I believe, in the, seventh, uh, the second heaven. And then the third heaven is the very throne room of God. Now, the third heaven is what you and I in English most commonly call heaven. The throne room of God where God dwells in unapproachable light. And we can see that part of the, the evidence of this is Paul writing to the church 
in Corinth saying, I, I know a man, whether in the body or not, I don't know, but he was caught up to the third heaven, to the throne room of God. And so just keep this in mind as you study Scripture. It helps to know their mindset so that we don't interject our modern American Western mindset into it, but we let the Scripture speak for itself. And so this battle takes place in heaven. And we find that Satan is fighting back. The dragon and his angels waged war. Remember, angels in the original Greek is angelos, and it just means messenger. We have biblical evidence that at least seven times, undeniably seven times, that word angelos in the New Testament is used to speak of human messengers. John the Baptist was an, uh, uh, John the Baptist sent messengers, angeloi, to go ask Jesus, are you the one or should we expect another? So it's a general term here for messengers. But Satan and his messengers, his angels, his demons are fighting against Michael. And they were not strong enough and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who's called the devil and Satan. Now, it struck me a number of years ago, studying scripture, especially in the, the face of the critique of an atheist, who was mocking Scripture, who was reading Scripture to, to make fun of it. And he was talking about, oh, when you guys believe in talking snakes. And I went, well, no, we don't. That's just stupid. Everybody knows it's the devil who's taken over the body of a snake. And I went and read Genesis, and if you just read Genesis, it doesn't actually say it's the devil. If you understand Scripture and if you look throughout the whole of Scripture, I think even people in the Old Testament knew exactly what was going on. But do you realize this is the first time in all of Scripture that the serpent of old is connected directly and overtly to Satan? Because, see, I, I remember growing up in Sunday school and we had the little flannel graph. You guys remember those, you know? And I'm, uh, oh, and here's Adam and Eve in the garden and they're hiding behind trees because they're naked and you don't show naked people at church. And so, you know, and, <laughs> and here's the apple or whatever it was and here's the serpent and stick it on the flannel graph. And the serpent we knew was the devil. And rightly they were saying it was the devil, that the devil had taken over a snake's body as a, a tool to be able to communicate to human beings. But this is where... The Sunday school teacher, whether they knew it or not, this is where it's overtly made totally clear. The serpent in the garden was Satan. Because see, if we go to Genesis 1, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. It does just say the serpent. It doesn't say Satan in there. But again, the context of the whole scripture is important. It just struck me. We don't find out overtly until Revelation 12. That's, that's who was behind Adam and Eve. Even though I was taught that from the time I was a wee little boy in Sunday school. It was true. But this is where you need to take people from uh, to atheists who mock the talking snake. Well, here, look. It wasn't just a snake, folks. It was the devil using the snake as a vehicle to communicate to Adam and Eve. And it goes on to describe Satan here, who deceives the whole world. Well, he's been at that for a while now, hasn't he? Started in the garden, has been deceiving the world. And, and again, it, it's not just the, the globe, the sphere we live on, but it's the people of the world. The people who are not children of God have been and will be and will continue to be deceived by Satan. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Remember, Michael, the archangel, is, and holy angels are fighting against him. Also remember, we saw, uh, I believe it was last week, how two-thirds of the angels of heaven stayed faithful to God. They did not rebel with Satan. Satan and his demons are always outnumbered. 
because only a third of them fell. We don't know how many angels there are. We just know that, that the, the holy angels outnumber the evil angels, the demons, two to one. And here, Satan and his demons are not strong enough to stay in heaven. They're thrown down. And what we find here, in the sounding of the seventh trumpet from a couple weeks ago, we foresee the rule of Christ. That's what Scripture tells us. And here we find the progressive arrival of the kingdom and rule of Jesus Christ starts with the expulsion of Satan and his demons from the heavens. I do believe, because it says he's sent to the earth, he's caged on the earth, if you will, that he's been banned from all three levels of heaven. His only area of operation now will be on the earth. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come, for the accuser of our brethren has been cast down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. Now, in context here, I think I can prove to you that this doesn't happen yet. And yet we find out that he accuses the believers in Jesus, you and me and all of us throughout time, before the Father. And, and of course, we're all perfect, so he has no ammunition, right? Right? Oh, nuts. Yeah, he's got things to bring up. Not only does he gossip the things that are true about us that we struggle with, that he points out to God, can you believe what your kid did? As parents, this must strike home just a little bit, you know? You ever have that happen? Hey, uh, little Junior uh, did something at school today and we need to talk. Your, your precious little angel. <laughs> yeah, we, as parents, we can all relate to that. That's what Satan is doing. Not only is he gossiping, he's slandering. Gossip is true truth that puts somebody in a bad light. Slander is a lie that puts somebody in a bad light. And Satan has been a liar from the beginning. Satan was a liar about Job. Did Job curse God? No. In fact, Scripture says in all of this, Job remained blameless. But Satan is the accuser of the brethren, day and night, pointing out our flaws, making up things about us, highlighting our sin before God. Can you believe what your so-called child did to God will put up with that no longer. And in the end, there's a celebration in heaven because God's rule is finally coming. Because Satan has been kicked out of the heavens never, ever to return again. Now, we need to talk about how the Bible describes Satan. Just real quick, I, I found this to be insightful, so I wanted to share it with all of us here. Number one is the dragon. A beast to be feared, a beast that kills and destroys. The, number two is the serpent of old, that liar, that deceiver that got us all in trouble. Imagine the world today if we hadn't given in to Satan. If Adam and Eve had seen through his lies and his deceit and said, stood up to him and said, No, look at the whole garden. There's just one tree we can't eat. Everything else is ours. Why would we eat the one thing God told us not to eat? He's the dragon. He's the serpent of old. He's the devil. Now, devil is the, the Greek term, diablos, and it is sort of the Greek idea of Satan. And literally, it means slanderer. He is Satan, which is a, which is a, a Greekism, if you will, to explain the Hebrew word, which meant the adversary or Satan. That's where we get those two different words from. For him, a slanderer, an adversary. He is a deceiver, as we've talked about in Genesis chapter 3. And, and lastly, he's described as the accuser of the brethren. That night and day he stands before God and accuses you and me and all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
with gossip, things that are true about us, and slander, things that are not true about us before God. Folks, the reality of this, as I thought about this this week, is that when we give in to the sin of slander and gossip, we follow in the footsteps of Satan. Let that sink in for just a second here, folks. This is how Satan acts. This is what he's actively doing today. When you and I do this, do these sins, I should say, commit these sins, we are acting like Satan. Because it's so easy in the church to excuse the sins of the tongue. Well, at least it's not, you know, it's not hatred. At least it's not, it's not murder. It's not adultery. It's not greed. It's not, we make all these excuses. But please notice, this is Satan's favorite sin. And I don't want to follow in the footsteps of the devil. I was speaking with a, a woman in one of the fellowships where I pastored and she was sharing how much she had been hurt by the women in the churches that she attended. By the gossip, the slander, the judgmental spirit that she had experienced. And folks, if we're really honest, all of us can give in to this, and all of us do, but my experience and my observation is this is one of the besetting sins of women. And it's something that we all need to work on because to do this is to walk in the footsteps of Satan. So how do we overcome this? Number one, I think, is by identifying a judgmental and critical spirit. Because most often the desire to gossip or slander about somebody is to make me look better and them look worse to my circle of friends. Because the worse somebody else looks, the better I look. Because, well, I don't struggle with that sin. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. I would never wear that out of the house. On and on the list goes of all the things. That judgmental, critical spirit is what drives gossip and slander out of both men and women. So it's got to start there. Now there's three practical steps for how to avoid giving in to gossip and slander. Number one is talk to God. When somebody, you know, when... When are you most likely to gossip or slander somebody? When you've been hurt, when you've been disappointed, when somebody does something that you find to be wrong, your reaction is to get even. But that's an evil reaction. Our first reaction needs to be to talk to God about it. God, I'm hurt. God, I'm disappointed. I'm let down. My husband forgot our anniversary again. My kids forgot my birthday. My, you know, my friends turned their back on me. Whatever it is, my coworkers are just plain mean. God, help me. Number two is talk to the person it's about. Instead of telling everybody else, if somebody's hurt your feelings, if somebody has caused you suffering, talk to the person. Don't talk to the whole rest of the church. It's amazing sometimes how when you actually do talk to the person, you find out, well, that wasn't their intent at all. That wasn't what they were trying to say. That wasn't what they meant to do. Or they maybe did intend to do that and need to apologize. Jesus talked about this. You know, if you find your brother trapped in a sin, you who are spiritual, go first. Jesus, and then Paul echoes Jesus. You who are spiritual, go in private and talk to them. That's what we're talking about here. And if they refuse to repent, take a couple more. Get the church leadership involved. Lastly, tell it to the church if they refuse to repent. But what we see happen in the church, my experience, we skip all the other steps and just tell the whole church. Or at least my group of friends in the church. You have a, a problem with a coworker. Talk to them. If you can't resolve it, talk to the boss. You don't need to talk to the entire rest of the staff in the building. Talk to somebody who can actually fix the problem. You got a problem with somebody at church. Talk to them or talk to one of the pastors. Let's fix it. Let's not make it worse by spreading it around the whole church. 
These are the only three people that you and I can talk to when we have a problem with somebody and not be gossiping. Because face it, we really don't want to be walking in the footsteps of Satan, do we? Really don't want to be doing this. And one last solution to the, the issue of gossip is found in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Now, this is a general principle, but I'm, I'm applying this to interpersonal relationships, and I think it really works well. Because, see, if we quit looking for things to criticize about other people, if we look for the good in other people, then that heart of bitterness goes away. That heart that wants to cut other people down so I look better goes away because what? We're looking for good in other people. We need to learn to look for good in other people, and we also need to learn to rightly look at ourselves. Not to be too critical of ourselves, but also not to give ourselves too big of an excuse. To see, yeah, I'm a broken sinner, and I'm loved by God, I'm a saint, and I'm imperfect. And learn not to have a judgmental spirit, but look for the good in other people. And what I'm talking about is not just sweeping things under the rug. Notice the point of this is to actually deal with things instead of making it worse or hiding it and burying it. He goes on here in chapter 12, verse 11. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. This is how we as believers overcome the system of this world, the system of Satan. This is how we stop following in the footsteps of the devil. By the blood of the Lamb, we need to remember that you and I cannot earn salvation. We cannot merit anything good from God on our own. Apart from Christ, there is no hope. Step one to overcoming this world and its system and its loves and its lusts is the blood of the Lamb. That is how we get free from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. The three categories into which all sins fit. The blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony... Folks, Jesus said, if you will deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. We live in a day when people are so flippant about their words, say things they never should have said. Just this week, I'm sorry to tell another soccer story, but I'm really not. So anyhow, uh, you got to forgive me. One of the biggest soccer teams in the whole world was hiring a new coach. And one of the coaches that I think really deserves a, t a chance, Murcia Pochettino, probably could have been hired by them. But back when he coached in the same league they're in, he said, I would never coach for Barcelona because he co coached at one of their main rivals. And he got passed over again a second time for being hired as the coach of Barcelona. And part of it is of his words. He had said, I'd rather work on my farm than coach Barcelona, and he's still working on his farm, not coaching a professional soccer league, because his words, our words, are important. And we need to remember that. An offhanded comment has cost that man millions of dollars in income and a chance to coach at one of the biggest soccer clubs in the world. But the importance of that, a job, pales in comparison to the, the importance of eternity. And the word of our testimony. We can't do it on our own. The blood of the Lamb is absolutely the only way of salvation. And yet, here we find there's a response of faith. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. 
No matter how unpopular that becomes, no matter how unpopular that was in Jesus' day and in Paul's day and in John's day, stay true to Jesus Christ. And then there's a third thing. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. We pray for the persecuted church every week because many in the persecuted church overcome the world at the cost of their own life. They refuse to change their testimony. They refuse to deny Jesus Christ even though it costs them imprisonment, even though it sometimes costs them their very life. You and I need to recognize this is the call of God for us. The response of faith from us is to stay true to Christ, knowing that we can't save ourselves and being ready to give up our life if necessary to stay true to Him. Now, at the end of service, I talked to Joe about this already, but at the end of service today, we're going to sing a song, Overcome, uh, by this man here. And I love the song, and the message is great. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, but it's only two-thirds of the scriptural truth. And maybe it's too hard to write a lyric that says, and not loving our lives even to the point of death. Or it's not popular to sing about that. But that is the biblical truth, folks. And I'm not against Jeremy Camp, and I'm not against that song. I want you to hear, though, we can't stop short of the whole counsel of God, which is how do we overcome the world? Blood of the Lamb. The word of our testimony, yes, I believe in Jesus, even when it becomes more and more unpopular. And being willing to die because of our faith if that's what it takes. Leaving prayer meeting on Tuesday night, I was thinking about this message and these verses came to my mind. And he, Jesus, was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. A continual death. That's what a cross symbolized, folks. Shame, death, suffering. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my name's sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? And the Greek here is his, his very soul. It's a great question. You see, what I find as I study Scripture is nowhere in Scripture... Does it ever say, just pray this simple prayer and you are saved? Jesus' call to salvation again and again and again is, come take up your cross, die to yourself, and follow me. Become my disciple. No matter what the cost, follow me. Now, does that mean everybody who's prayed the simple prayer is not saved? Absolutely not. That may be the first step of faith in a person's life. So we don't judge people on that. But if that's all that's ever happened, then we need to go look at the parable of the sower. There's different kinds of ground and the weeds come and choke out the life. And I mean, there's all sorts of different results from a, an apparent beginning of faith according to the words of Jesus. So the call for all of us is to pick up our cross daily, die to ourselves and follow Jesus Christ. So again, we overcome the world by three things. The blood of the Lamb. Jesus is the only way to save humanity. We cannot save ourselves. The word of our testimony. Yes, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. No matter how evil Facebook and Twitter and other people think that is. And I'm willing to pay the ultimate price. If that's what it takes. So that we overcome this world and its system. And so our third fill-in is the biblical call to salvation is always a call to follow Jesus and die to ourselves. It's hard to do, folks. We all have those days when the flesh 
throws a temper tantrum. When our desires, our anger, our struggles gets in the way. And then we go back to the blood of the Lamb. Okay, Jesus, I need forgiveness. Jesus, rescue me from my flesh. And we start all over again. Word of my testimony. Not loving my life, even to the point of death. For this reason rejoice, O heavens. Why? Because Satan's been cast out. Never, ever, ever in all eternity to return to the throne room of God, to the second heaven, and I believe even to the atmosphere in our earth. He's chained to this earth. But, O heavens, rejoice, and you who dwell in them, woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. And what we find here is the third of the three woes that that eagle flying in mid heaven said were coming. Or was, yeah, we're coming. And this is why I say I'm convinced that this happens during the tribulation. Heavens are finally clean. Heaven is finally purified once and for all. Satan and his demons will never be allowed back in in the time of the seventh trumpet, which is the third woe. And folks, if I'm really, really honest with y'all, I think this third woe might be the worst thing, the worst punishment from God. In, in essence, what God is doing here is saying, oh, y'all like to serve Satan? Well, here, have a triple helping of him because he's coming. And he's full of anger. He's full of wrath. He's full of evil. Remember in the days of Noah when the thoughts of mankind was violence all the time, was wickedness all the time. Imagine the one who's behind that being here in person in great anger, knowing he's only got a little bit of time left to lash out at God through destroying human beings that God has made in His image. Folks, history has shown us evil personified. One of the most evil people in the last century there, Joseph Stalin. And not to be outdone, in the middle there is Margaret Sanger, the, the founder of what would eventually become Planned Parenthood probably found in an organization that's killed as many innocent people as Hitler or Stalin. Maybe more. Butchering innocent babies while in the womb is evil. 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 I don't need to talk much about Hitler and what he did. Understand this, though. The eugenics movement that motivated Hitler to kill six million Jews and six million other people that were undesirables in Germany is the exact same thing Margaret Sanger believed. She wrote an op-ed that we needed to pull the human weeds because of eugenics. Now imagine we have three people evil personified here, but imagine Satan coming in person, the overwhelming force of a being much stronger than you or I on this earth with all his demons, never to return to heaven, full of wrath, knowing his time is short, trying to do as much to destroy humanity as possible. In that time, he may indeed make these three infamous characters from history look like child's play. This may be the worst judgment of God yet. You like evil? I'll give you evil. I'll give you Satan himself. And he won't be able to escape. This is what faces the people of the world. And this is why it's so important that you and I are saved through the blood of the Lamb. Continue to walk with God as exemplified by the word of our testimony. What we say, I am a Christian and all that it means, I believe. 
by not loving our lives even unto death. That's the only way to escape what is to come. The ultimate what is to come, which is the lake of fire forever. So this third woe to the people of the earth may be the worst judgment of God yet. Aren't you grateful that we don't have to suffer the judgment of God? In Christ, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. You and I no longer have to be slaves to the sins of the tongue. Slaves to gossip and slander. Slaves to this world and its system. By the power of God, we can be free. The call of God for us is to persevere, is to be overcomers. Remember, we read through Revelation 2 and 3, and again and again and again and again, it says, to him who overcomes, I will give a white stone with a new name on it. To him who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he'll never go out again. And to those who overcome, to those who overcome, this is not something that's only for great Christians. This is a call for every person who's been saved by the blood of Jesus. And so this morning, are you overcoming this world and its system? Or are you and I being overcome by this world and its system and its loves? Father God, the only way we can escape is by the blood of the Lamb. I pray for everyone here, Lord. If there's anybody here who hasn't put their faith in you alone for salvation, I pray that they would do so. I pray that they would look into this for themselves because this day is coming and your righteous wrath will be poured out. We thank you for Jesus and the way of escape. Help us, Lord. Not to live as a reviler, a slanderer, a gossip. Help us, Lord, to look for the good and what's excellent and what's of noble, uh, what's noble and what's of good repute, Lord. And help us, Lord, to value the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and not to value our lives more than we value you, but to be ready to even die should you require that of us. In Jesus' name, amen.